Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're continuing in Daniel chapter 11, uh, looking at Raphi and Paneum. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we give our hearts to you this morning and thank you for what you have been doing in our lives. And um, we just invite your presence as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that there's little that we actually truly understand. But we know that we can know you as we yoke up with Christ, as we seek to follow and serve you. And we pray for each person who is studying these things and searching for truth. We pray, Lord, that you can strengthen them and guide them uh, through the struggles and the trials of life. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so yesterday we, uh, I don't know if refined is the right word, but we corrected some of our understanding in regard to Raphi and Paneum and also um, Daniel 11 verse 10. So we've, we've been struggling through uh, trying to trying to see how the present truth application fits in with our minds. And we know that uh, when we began this the study of understanding the lines, which was uh, a long, long time ago, and we had gone through these lines, we ended up spending a great deal of time in the book of Judges. The book of Judges taught us a lot of things. And one was um, uh, that we had uh, these structures with these, with these lines where we could zoom into a waymark and we can create a new line. And that um, these zoom ins, these wheels within wheels, um, illustrate the whole line. So when we zoom into a waymark, uh, we can understand um, uh, how that way mark relates to the line above it. Now, one of the things that we have only slightly addressed in this line, and, and, and I think that we're gonna have to figure that out as we go through, but one thing we have not done is place the entire line of Daniel, or of Daniel chapter 11. We haven't placed that on a line. And we know that it begins with the kings of Persia, and then it's going to move to the king, kingdom of Greece, and then to, to Rome, and then to pagan Rome, and um, then the fall of or pa pagan Rome, and then papal Rome. And then uh, it's going to bring us to 1798, and then to 1989, and Daniel 11, verse 40. And then it's going to bring us to the Sunday law, the close of probation. And so we've never really touched on how that whole Daniel 11 can be placed on a line. But we should be able to do that, correct? Agreed. So it's, it's something that we're going to have to look at. But for now, what we've been doing is looking at each of these, these periods, the Persian period first, and then uh, the Greek period. And we can see that both of them illustrate our history. That is, they illustrate the history of this movement uh, from November 9th, 1989 to the present. Now, with, with the book of Judges, we had uh, Judges chapter 2 that guide us, guided us in, in the basic understanding that it was illustrating the history of this movement from uh, September 11th, uh, 2001 to... Um, January 11th, 2023. So, so that was something that we had we had noted, and we then began looking at Judges and found that it fit into that structure. Now, of course, it, it reached back to November 9th, 1989, and it reached forward to a symbolic date of April 5th, 2030, a date that is 2300 lunar months from the first day of the first month in 1844, and it's the first day of the first month, commencing the 187th uh, year from 
the first day of the first month in 1844. And of course, we know if you go from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, it's 187 days, 186 cardinal, 187 inclusive. And so, so it seemed too much of a coincidence, all of these different structures dealing with that period of uh, 67,920 days from April 19th, 1844 to April 5th, 2030. And so as we worked through the lines, um, we started to see that, that each of these lines began at some time in our history and ended sometime in our history. But this April 5th, 2030 date uh, was important and we just don't know what it means. That we just say it's a symbol because we're not predicting any events in the future on specific dates. Uh, we know some generally what's going to happen in the future, but when it's going to happen, uh, that we don't know. So, so we went through the Persian kings um, and uh, sp specifically Daniel 11, uh, verse 2, that addresses um, that line of the Persian kings all the way up to Trump, right? And then we spent all this time going through you know, Esther and Ezra and, and different books, and of course, Revelation 12, 13, and 17, um, trying to, to understand how we would apply um, the seven kings of Revelation 17. And we came to the conclusion that the five are fallen is um, uh, going to begin with, um, you know, Bush the first. So you got Bush the first, Clinton, Bush the second, uh, Obama, and then Trump. And the one that is, is Biden. And then there's one to come, the seventh, and then there's going to be the eighth. So how that works exactly in the future, we don't know. And then we looked at the line of Greece, right? So we looked at Alexander's kingdom. We could see that it paralleled our history. Um, and it begins, though, with the Soviet-Afghan war. And we could see how the symbols fit in with that. And I still have lots of notes to add uh, to this study as far as the chronology and the symbols. Um, but just looking at um, these uh, uh, the verses and looking at the historical application, we've been able to place um, our history as a parallel to that historical application. And so then we ended up with this line, which is uh, placing all of those events, the Af Soviet Afghan War, uh, uh, November 9th, 1989, the 777 days there, the September 11th, and these different symbols or spans of time addressing uh, based on these Hebrew definitions, which was uh, fairly profound. And, and one is that we have this span of time from September 11th, 2001 to December 25th, 2023, and also the four winds of heaven going from uh, February 15th, 1989, the end of the Soviet-Afghan war. I believe it's from the end of it. It might be from the beginning of it. Maybe it's the beginning of it should have that more clearly marked. Um, but that's going to bring us also to December 25th, 2023. And so uh, so we have this amazing coincidence, which obviously is God's providence, showing us something. Um, so the four winds of heaven and years, so that Shana, Shanian, uh, <clears throat> uh, no, pardon me, no, just, Shaniam, yeah, that's right, Shaniam, years being plural. Shana is singular, Shaniam is plural. And, and so after we had done that, we had um, then started looking at um, these lines relating to, well, first Daniel 11, verse 10. And that was difficult because we tried to say, how does this fit in? Uh, what do we what do we place in this verse? And so we took Seleucus's sons, uh, Seleucus the third and Antiochus the third, um, and we said that this is something that's happening 
uh, with apostate Protestantism and uh, Republicanism, apostate Republicanism, in this church-state relation. And it's about a propaganda campaign against wokeism. And um, so they use all these different forms of media. Uh, and, and then one son, Antiochus III, we say, well, maybe that is, no, we put Republican President Trump. Well, Antiochus III is already one of the sons. So whether that's actually President Trump as a person or something to do with Republicanism, I just put it there that we have this Antiochus III in opposition to um, uh, Ptolemy III, who we're saying is Biden. But we're, we're still going to work through some of these things. Right now, we're, we're just we're putting these things here as sort of placeholders to kind of keep straight in our mind how we're understanding these things. Um, and we know that we have an, a fortress that is the American Constitution and, and um, this was one of the things that we looked at when he was stirred up even to his fortress. Um, initially, this was applied to um, Ptolemy, uh, was it Ptolemy the fourth? I can't remember, or the third. Um, <clears throat> but that didn't really make sense because if we parallel this with verse nine, to return, um, and then come to his fortress, it wouldn't be the fortress of the king of the south, it would be the fortress of the king of the north. So we said that this fortress here is the American Constitution, which originally we were looking at it as wokeism. So we made a change in the application. So, so these are just some of the things. This is just kind of a sketch or an overview of some of the things that we have noticed. <clears throat> so then we began looking at uh, Daniel 11, verse 11 to 13. And Daniel 11 has a bunch of symbols attached to it. We can take all the Hebrew numbers and add them up. And what we get is uh, the number of days, that's 67,340, which is um, <clears throat> a symbol of 187 years and 20 days. So that, that gives you that symbol of 18720. And then you would add to it the last word in the verse. So that's without the last word, but the last word is 3027, which is a symbol of March 27th. And so we could see that uh, July 18, 2020 and March 27th, 2020 are symbolized in Daniel 11, verse 11. Now, Daniel 11, verse 11 is about the Battle of Raphia. And we have applied its symbolism to our line. We're saying that that's January 11th, um, or pardon me, January 6, 2021. That's going to be the siege of Washington. And um, yet we still see that the Battle of Raphia is a future event. And that is, it is events on uh, this line. So I'm going to just quickly do something here, get to this. I'm going to have to make this a lot bigger. This is just me taking a another chart. Now I'm going to create this chart online. So one of the things we know is we had in 2016, uh, we had this line, and I'm gonna try to recreate this here. And it, and it looked something like this, um, which, Hang 
Peter's um, running a bit slow. I'm not sure why. <laughs> So we had something where we had these way marks. So I'm going to move these up. And we always put Midnight Cry in the middle, uh, initially back in 2016. And then we would have this smaller way mark, uh, Midnight, like this. So, so this was our line in 2016. So we had 9-11, Midnight Cry, and then the Sunday line. And that's because those were our three waymarks. We always had three waymarks in a line. You know, initially we had 1989, the Sunday Law, the close of probation. Right? Those were our three waymarks. And as time went on, we kept zooming into these lines. And... So by 2016, Jeff had created this line where the Sunday law is the close of probation. 9-11 is um, the first day of the first month. So I'm just going to use this here. So you're going to have the first day, first, first month symbol here. <clears throat> and you're going to have this happen for each of these lines that we're going to have dates in Millerite history. Now, in some ways, it doesn't really make sense how we drew the line. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember if, if we had um, put midnight, if we moved it over. Um, so, I mean, I would have moved it over, but right now we're going to first day of the fifth month. Now, I don't know if this has, um, if people care about this anymore, right? Um, like in the movement. So the movement has moved away from an understanding of July 18th even, but this idea came in 2013, right? So in 2013, um, um, Emiliano, Emiliano Richards um, came to recognize something about Ezra uh, chapter eight, chapter seven and eight, but, but I think Ezra seven, nine, just that that story of the journey from Babylon to Jerusalem included this first day of the fifth month and the first day of the first month. And he came to recognize that there must be some connection between this first day and the fifth month and the midnight cry in Millerite history. So we came to understand this way mark, the midnight cry, which um, uh, we had put at Exeter. We just didn't have a biblical date for it. it is, we didn't even really understand that the first day of the first month was April 19th, but we really had an understanding that the first day of the first was, month was March 21st. But of course, if you count it from March 21st, to October 22nd, you wouldn't have uh, the 10th day of the seventh month, right? So it wasn't really saw, thought through uh, initially in this movement until 2013 when we started looking at this. And um, so these lines, this line here, I mean, is the line of the second angel's message, right? From the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. It's not including the first angel's message. Now, when Jeff was making this hour line, he was really saying, whether he understood it or not, um, that, that we are in the time of the second angel's message, which I think he did understand the second angel arrives at 9-11. Um, but... Um, to take this as an entire line, it we're zooming into something, 
right? We're not, we're not looking at Millerite history. We're looking at the second angel's message as in a sense, representing Millerite history. So, uh, so I um, don't know really what else to do with it here at this point to, to go into how much detail I should go into. <clears throat> But we need to keep this in mind, right? That when we're looking at Raphia and Paneum, that these are events that are on this line. Um, or these, these way marks, right? So we can all agree with this that Raphi and Paneum are midnight in the midnight cry. And that if we look at the Sunday law, now what Sunday law is this? This is the close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. So is this the Sunday law in the United States or is this a universal Sunday law that we put on this line? It would almost seem to be the universal Sunday law. Okay, so it would be the universal Sunday law, which begins in the United States. So the Sunday law begins in the United States. And so we would have to say wherever the Sunday law occurs, first in the United States, then in the world, probation is closing for Seventh-day Adventists, right? Agreed. So Seventh-day Adventists know about the Sabbath. Now, there may be individually some Adventists who have been so deceived that it's not going to be until after the Sunday law comes that they begin to study and start to understand what's happening. Um, but just as a general thing, we would say that the close of probation occurs for Seventh-day Adventists. Now, we know that um, at 9-11, the Seventh-day Adventist church was passed by. Right. So the organizational structure has closed its probation. And it had lots of opportunity uh, to accept a, a message that was given prior to 9-11 and even prior to 1989, but it continued to reject that message. And so it's passed by. It, it closes its probation. Um, but Seventh-day Adventists still have this opportunity. Their probation is not closed. So when we say an institution closes its probation, it's just its role and function has now changed. And, um, you know, we could say at the cross uh, that the institution of Judaism closed its probation. Leadership closed their probation with the crucifixion of Christ. But it's going to be at the stoning of Stephen that actually the nation closes its probation. So we, we could sort of make a parallel there. We, we placed 9-11 as the cross. But anyway, getting back to this Rafi and Panin, we, we know that um, we had a fulfillment of, of Midnight in the Midnight Cry in our history in different places. So... We could say, well, raffia has occurred, especially on the January 6, 2021. But we can't say that that raffia is this raffia. That we are zoomed into something. Now, when we look at 9-11 as the first day of the first month, we know that... Um, That's the arrival of the second angel's message, right? Nine, nine eleven is the empowerment of the first angel's message, but when we mark it as the first day of the first month, it's it's the arrival of the second angel's message, right? So it, it's not it's not the empowerment of the first; it's the arrival of the second. But we also had marked, um, so I'm just taking this here. We had marked, I'm just going to put it like this. We have 11.9. 9. 
and 11.9 is connected to 9.11, right? Now, we, we, don't, we don't have a date here, right? So 11.9, we, we, we don't mark it in Millerite history as a separate date or event. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how we could put this in here. Um, uh, we have Samuel Snow's letters. We have the prediction before midnight. So I'm not really sure how we could take this line and place it in here. I'm just going to go back here. Um, I'm just going to get rid of this box. So for now, we'll just put 11.9 in there. We just say, if there's 11.9, it's something that's connected to 9.11. And uh, it's 2019, right? So 11.9.19, is, it's obviously after 2001. And these two waymarks are both the arrival of the second angel. So when we look at 11.9, we can say that raphia and paneum occur within our line. Right? We can say that. Because raphia can be January 6, 2021. And paneum is still something that's that's future. This is going to be this response of the Republican Party to what? To Trump losing the election. But this is not the Rafi and Paneum on the big line that Jeff had. Right? When we put 11.9 in here, we are, are zooming into something. Correct? We're not, we're not on the big line anymore. We're not on Jeff's line. We're not just the big line. We're not on Jeff's line. But all of that history that had to do with, um, and, and even then we could say, well, you know, November 9th, in some ways we marked as Raffia and July 18th as Paneum. So, so in different ways we applied Raffia and Paneum. But when we put 11.9 there, as a parallel to the first day and first month. We'll just say it that way. 9-11 and 11-9 are both the first day of the first month. We're obviously zooming into this history. We're not just um, filling in details on Jeff's line that weren't there. We're actually zooming into a line. Jeff's line still stands on its own. Okay. So every time when we're, when we're going through this, when we start to come back and we look at the big picture, when we take Daniel 11 and we put it on these lines, we saw this with the book of Judges, we have this big line, which had these different way marks. And then we said, well, the different judges are the different messages that are aligned with these different way marks. We're going to have something similar in Daniel chapter 11. We're going to have not just his history from 9-11, but it's going to go back to 1989, and it's going to go all the way up to a waymark in the future, right? Maybe the Sunday law, however we're going to look at it. It's going to com comprise that entire line. So the book of Daniel should be done that way. And I don't think that, that um, I don't think Jeff saw that, I don't think he thought about it. And, and what we're seeing presently in Jeff's articles is kind of an abandonment of this, of putting things on the line in the way that we do, where we have the first angel's message arrives, it's formalized and powered, the second arrives, it's formalized and powered, and then the third arrives, and then there's also a fourth. And in do, in failing to do that, it it opens up the door for all kinds of interpretations, right? So in the back of my mind, every time we're looking at these things, I'm thinking about this structure. I'm not just saying, well, this fits with this and this fits with that. Because if you start to do that, if you start to just make a, um, a prophetic collage, let's put it that way, that there is no real structure. There's nothing that really fits in its place. And, and things become random. They become open to all kinds of interpretations. 
And so we need to keep this in mind. And so as we've looked at these lines, we've we've kept coming back to these to this structure, right? So that's why here, you know, we have this structure. We're not just putting dates on a line. We can see that these dates fit in with the structure. And that structure is the structure from Millerite history. So, so we are going to come back to this at, at some point. So I'm just setting up that template. Okay. Now, I, I want to point out something else, um, which is um, here in this section. So this is the section that's Raffi and Phineas, Daniel 11, 11 to 13. And um, we have this phrase. So um, uh, shall certainly come after certain years. Now, I, I've added some notes here that we're going to look at. Now, when we look at the word certain, H6256, Angela, what is that? Uh, that's three, 360, which represents a prophetic year. Right. So if you take six times two times five times six, it's 360. Now, the word certain occurs in uh, verse six at the end of verse uh, six of Daniel 11, where it says that strengthened her in these times. The word times is H, H 6256, the Hebrew word 6256. And it's a period of 17 years and 46 days. And if you start on November 9th, you count 6,256 days, you'll come to December 25th. So it occurs as a span of time, but it symbolizes our period from November 9th, uh, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, right? That's 777 days. Now, if we do this, we don't have actually a November 9th and a December 25th that specifically fits this, that we say this is a November 9th that we mark and this is a December 25th that we mark. It's just if you take, if you start on November 9th and you in any year and you count to December 25th, you'll get that number of days. <clears throat> so, so that word occurs here in, in this passage, right? It's translated certain instead of times. So he shall certainly come after times years if we were going to translate the word this the same, which doesn't really make much sense. Um, now, uh, we also have the word years. Now, the word years, uh, Shanaim, 8141, we talked about at the beginning of the study here. Um, 8141 is a period of 22 years and 105 days, right? So we had said if you counted from uh, uh, September 11th, 2001, uh, it'll bring you to December 25th, 2023. So both of these numbers, one starting at November 9th, and one starting at September 11th, these two symbols that are really the same symbol, both produce the date December 25th. So, so that's significant that they are put here together. Okay, that makes sense to people. Any questions on that? Now, of course, this is talking about the Battle of Panea. And they shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and much riches. So this is Antiochus III, who would defeat Ptolemy V Epiphanes at the Battle of Panea in probably 200 BC, driving Egypt out of Judea, Palestine once and for all. And we're saying that this is paralleling the midnight cry. That's our suggestion. <clears throat> so... We say Paneum's the midnight cry. And so that's all we're saying about it. We don't have a date for it. We don't, we don't know exactly how it's going to occur, how it's going to look in, in the headlines in the news, but it's going to be the midnight cry. So this is, is uh, 
this symbol of certain years that brings us to Panin. So then we should say, well, certain years, those numbers must have something to do with the span of time. And so what I did, and I have a footnote here. Um, so I, I'm gonna just zoom in a little bit here for this. So I took uh, these two and added them together, right? So I took uh, the, the 22 years and 105 days and the 17 years and 46 days. And, um, and then I added them together. And so they are a period of 14,397 days. Now, that number, when I looked at it, I recognized that it was actually 360 days short of the whole span of time from November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030. That is, if we take um, 8141 and add it to 6256, and then we take the symbolism of 360 that comes from 6256, we have a period of 14,757 days. So that's simply 6256 plus um, 8141 plus 360. And so it gives us that whole span of time. And so if we're going to interpret this certain days or certain years, pardon me, we would have to say that this is marking Paneum as this symbolic date of April 5th, 2030. That it's somehow connected with that. I'm not saying that April 5th, 2030 is going to be the Battle of Paneum. I'm just saying it's symbolically connected with that date. Right? So this symbolic span of time is connected to these literal, literal number of days here to that April 5th, 2030. So what would that mean? So I know I'm just throwing this at you, but what would this mean about so shall certainly come after certain years? We're taking this certain years, but we're saying it's, it's matching the whole span of time that we had when we studied the book of Judges. We have this number, but we, we didn't have anything for it. We just, we just had the number. We can count from November 9th, 1989, and we could go to April 5th, 2030, and we can count 14,757 days. But we didn't have something like this here, certain years to, to give us that span of time, but now we do. So what does that mean? Does this help us place Paneum as future? not just the events that we're presently in, in you know, 23, 24, 25, but is something that still is future. That this is, this is the Paneum on Jeff's line. Not marking a specific date, but just saying that that date symbolized this application for the additional extension of time for paying American taxes, right? which we had you know, last year around this time, uh, November 24th, I believe we we're counting uh, 2688 days, right? So, so we keep coming up to symbols that bring us to that date. But this here occurs in the verse for the Battle of Paneum. So any thoughts on that? Okay, so Angela says, we've always said our line is typical. It's progressive. I don't know when she just, if she just said that recently, because I just noticed this. Um, so, but if we think about that, that our line is typical, what we have been going through is typical. That we're typifying Raffi and Paneum. Now, that we're not in the actual Raffi and Paneum. Is that acceptable to people that we can 
we can make that claim. Yes. Okay. So it, it's something that helps confirm what we were doing with this study, right? Taking this and saying, this is a global situation. This is not what's happening within the United States. It, the United States is involved because, you know, they're the king of the North, right? And, they, and they're going to conquer the world. And that opens the door for the Sunday law. Right? Because in order for the, the United States to influence the world with apostate Protestantism and apostate Republicanism, to institute a universal Sunday law throughout the world, first beginning in the United States. Something like this has to happen. We have to have this global event and midnight in the midnight cry. If we, if we try to just place those in what has happened in the United States, we're trying to say what happened with Donald Trump or losing the election, um, siege of Washington, that's, that's, Raffia, and then we're going to have, you know, Trump come again, and he's going to defeat the Democrats in this next election, and then that's going to be the battle of Canium. That's the midnight cry, and and then Trump is going to institute the Sunday law, and and that could be possible that something like a Sunday law would occur in in the United States under Republicanism, which wouldn't necessarily be a Sunday law strictly but something similar to what happened uh, as far as human rights being, or I should say individual rights being violated by the state under the Democrats. And that you just get a response in kind from the Republicans towards their enemies. And that all the things that the Democrats did that were so uh, unseemly from the point of view of us more conservative, blokes, right? Um, that those same unseemly things will occur with their enemies. That, it, that they're really no different. Even though they, they speak, that you know, they make a good talk, right? Listen to the Republicans and what they're talking about, individual rights and freedom of speech. Well, those things can just be swept away once you're in power. We see this happen all the time. You know, you have, I've seen it on church, church levels where you have a church and you have people who are uh, writing on the church and how much it's trying to control their actions and doesn't allow people to have their own views and opinions. But if those people end up in power, they're worse uh, than the ones that they were complaining about as far as controlling others. <clears throat> Yeah, Angela has an interesting note there. Just, you know, the April 5th, that's the fifth day of the fourth month or the fourth month, fifth day, uh, relating to the 45 on the chart. And we've taken this 45 as a symbol. It's, it's an important symbol. 45th president. Uh, we have 1945 with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and so we're not really sure what that means except that it is on the 1843 chart and so in some ways that that date symbolizes that but to know exactly how things are going to unfold and when they're going to unfold um the 2030 date and you know if we just consider the 2030 date as a prophetic date that god put a date there that's going to be part of of history in some way um it's definitely if you look at the election in coming up in, in uh, 2024, and then you're gonna have a new president uh, in 2025. Well, it's gonna be not till 2029 that you get the next president, you know, if everything works out the way it's supposed to, whether that's the next president or even the same president, right? So you could have the same president, whoever depends, you know, if Trump becomes president, he, he wouldn't be president again in 2030, he wouldn't be president in that period. Uh, but if some new person becomes president, whether Republican or Democrat, 
he, he could serve two terms and be a president in 2030. Um, and so we could see that, that events could unfold in such a way that this eventually works into uh, this whole midnight cry as part of Paneum on, on a global scale with, with that um, seventh president. Now, of course, we know that a civil war is coming. There's lots of things that we don't know about it. We just know that there's going to be this civil war that we have now is, is it's been brewing and forming and battle lines are being drawn, uh, but it hasn't come to a head, so to speak. So, so that's going to happen at some point. And so we don't know specifically what the Battle of Paneum is. When it was first talked about in, in Alberta on January 14th, 2017, uh, when we talked about Rafi and Paneum, Paneum, it was that weekend from the 12th to the 14th. Um, or was it the 13th to the 15th? I can't remember. Anyway, I think the 14th was the Sabbath. Uh, so when we we talked about this, you know, the, the question was, was this going to be some kind of stealth warfare? Was it going to be, um, you know, a computer warfare, uh, uh, what they call a cyber warfare, or was it going to be some kind of hot war? And, I mean, we knew little about Rafi and Panin, but the idea that it's an actual battle between two countries was the basic idea, the U.S. and Russia. Now we're saying, well, you know, it, it's broader than that. So, so this is something we still have to have to uh, consider, right? So, so we have it there. We have this, all of these. Donald Trump would be eighty-four in twenty thirty. Another symbol on the eighteen forty-three chart. Twelve times seven is eighty-four. Yeah, thanks for that, Angela. Okay. Um, yeah, so when does Trump, yeah, I guess that would be 84. Okay. Yeah, because he was, uh, can't remember exactly how that worked, but he was around 70 years and he's going to be 77 um, and then 84. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, now those times after the fifth Syrian war. So this is, we're looking at verse 14. Uh, there shall be many, so Philip, king of Macedon, and Antiochus III, stand up and make war against the king of the south, Ptolemy Philippat, also the robbers of thy people, Rome, and we haven't put what that is in, what that's going to symbolize, shall exalt themselves. So. Uh, here, we would have to say that this is going to be modern Rome, right? So just for clarity's sake and to try to see how we're looking at this. So this is going to be the papacy. At some point comes into this history. Now, this, this puts it at... Um, after the battle of Panim, so after the midnight cry, the robbers of thy people. Now we're going to say the robbers of thy people are Rome. When we were using Swearingen's guy who laid this out here with this historic interpretation, um, he's going to put, you know, Antiochus Epiphanes here. But we agree that that can't be Antiochus Epiphanes. At least that's our understanding of it. Now. We said, you know, Tychus Epiphanes could be part of this history. And, and if we put a Tychus Epiphanes there, the Tychus Epiphanes would be playing the role that the papacy plays, right? But we would say that Rome should be the one that plays the role of the papacy. So any thoughts on this again? Because we, we kind of finished off with this idea yesterday. So our historic application, I'm going to 
go here to Swearingen's uh, paper. So when he goes through this, this whole history, we started reading some of this. Um, so we're gonna have uh, the Battle of Raffia, uh, 217 BC on June 22nd, right? The Battle of Pydna is also June 22nd, 49 years later in 168. Um, and we're also gonna talk a little bit about 191 BC um, and how that fits in here. Um, so when he goes through this here, the king of the north shall return, come with a great multitude greater than the former. That's going to be the Battle of Paneum, right? The, um, by starting the Fifth Syrian War through the invasion of Syria, the seizure of Gaza, Gaza, and the occupation of Palestine, right? Okay. And then what you're going to see is... Uh, um, in those times... Many shall stand up against the king of the south, follow me. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and cast up the mountain, and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of kings, right? So he's going to interpret this. So he says, the battle of Paneum resulted in the expulsion of Egypt from hollow Syria once and for all, while at the same time, seriously weakening its, weakening its status as a Mediterranean power, having become vulnerable to foreign invasion, this defeat had marked the beginning of the end for Ptolemaic Egypt. Many in those times would stand up against the king of the south. And this would be especially true in the career of Antiochus IV at Pippides. So what he's going to say, many, he's going to throw in here Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He had launched a successful invasion of Egypt, which later bring pagan Rome directly into Middle Eastern affairs and eventually lead to the demise of both the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic dynasties. After the death of Ptolemy IV Epiphanes, another young boy, King Ptolemy VI Philomir, would ascend to the throne at a very young age. This young king would be under the guardianship of two ministers of state, Julius and Linnaeus, who began to plan another invasion of hollow Syrians, 170 BC, in revenge for the Egyptian defeat at the Battle of Paneum, right? So we're just going to continue to have these, these wars here going on between the king of the north and the king of the south, except that we see that this is, is cleaning up after the Battle of Paneum. So Egypt is basically kicked out of of Syria, hollow Syria, right? That's Palestine and Syria and, you know, Judea, that area. Okay, so to bring this uh, Atticus the fourth in here just seems, seems redundant, okay? Um, so I don't think that we're going to have all of these kings involved, but we could be wrong, right? Now, he in this this history he's going to bring us to the victory of uh, um so uh that they're going to defeat uh macedonia at the victory of pydna in 168 so we know that's all just so june 2nd just as raffia is i've wondered about it why that is uh, we have the 168 bc date um which I think, is that on the 1850 chart or something like that? Okay. Um, so the SDA Bible commentary, commentary equates Antiochus Epiphany's efforts to force Jews to be thoroughly Hellenized is the most significant intertestamental history. I do see the parallel with the papacy wanting everyone to be Roman Catholic, at least outwardly. So, so I mean, we're going to consider it, right? Even though... Uh, we definitely wouldn't put Atticus Epiphanes as the little horn you know, in, in Daniel 8. But, but it is possible that Atticus Epiphanes fits in here. So we, we still have to consider that. Um, and one of the things is this battle of Pydna. So if we have the 49 years from the Battle of Raphi on June 22nd to the Battle of Pydna, um, also on June 22nd. So that one's in 168, the other one's 217. 
are these just connected by the 49 years and the two dates, but not really connected prophetically? Or is there a prophetic connection between, between these two? Now, hopefully people are following this history. Um, but this is going to be the view that um, Swearingen has, right? So he's going he's gonna to be continuing to follow these um, and, and, and saying that he attempted to exalt himself by robbing the people of Daniel would ultimately fall and fail. And his failure would be to establish the vision. That's where we would have the greatest difficulty because the vision there is the zone. And does the Taikis Epiphanies have anything to do with establishing the Chazon vision? Absolutely not. Right. So, so in considering this, we could say, well, there's some logic, you know, we're going to just follow through with these kings of Syria and Egypt um, and follow through that history. But yet, this doesn't really make any sense if we're going to take this shall exalt themselves to establish the Chazon. Well, I don't see how a Tychus Epiphanes could be tied to that unless you were arguing that a Tychus Epiphanes is the little horn of Daniel chapter 8, right? And we could say that in some ways what occurs there parallels it or is an echo of it, but we couldn't make it as a main interpretation of this verse. That's my view. But the ones that exalt, the robbers of thy people have to be Rome. It has to be in our application, the papacy coming in and exalting themselves. So they come into history. So the papacy, Rome comes into history and the papacy uh, is going to, when they exalt themselves, they're going to join in the threefold union at the Sunday law, right? So to me, this is about the Sunday law, that universal Sunday law. It's not just, it's not just a Sunday law in the United States. It's, it's a universal Sunday law. Okay, and and it fits at the right time, right? As far as how we understand uh, prophecy. Now, so when they come to establish the vision, right? We're saying that they're exalting themselves. Rome represents the two desolating powers. Now, when it when it comes to the chazon, is the chazon? It's a trick question. Is the Kazon the 2520 for Northern Israel or is the Kazon the 2520 for Judah? Because we agree that Kazon is the 2520. It's not the 2300 days. But is it the 2520 for Judah or the 2520 for Northern Israel? Uh, is it not the 2520 for Judah? Because uh, it, uh, is it not ending in uh, 1843? 1844. Okay, so so let's take a look. We're, we're going to go to uh, scriptures here. Just hang on. Um, and take a look at how we understand Daniel chapter 8. Okay, so in Daniel chapter 8, we're going to have this kazone. And um, so we know that we have 
It's going to start with um, the two horned beast, right? It's going to start with Persia. One horn's higher than the other, right? And, and then you're going to have Greece come against it with a notable horn between its eyes. And it's going to strike. They're going to come into this conflict, the ram um, with two horns and the goat with the notable horn, you know, um, come and conquer uh, Persia. So that's going to be Alexander, right? With this uh, great horn. And then that horn is going to be broken, verse 8. And, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So these are going to be um, Lysimachus, uh, Cassander, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, right, ultimately, these four generals. And then you're going to have this little horn come out of it, right? And that little horn is not going to be Antiochus Epiphanes. It's going to be Rome. Both pagan and papal Rome in here are, are symbolized. And it alternates between masculine and feminine, uh, showing the masculine being pagan Rome, the feminine being papal Rome. And, um, and then he's going to magnify himself even to the prince of the host. That's the he, that's pagan Rome. And from pagan Rome, the daily is taken away, the daily not daily sacrifice, but the daily is going to be taken away. In this case, it's lifted up and exalted. And the place of his sanctuary, pagan Rome sanctuary, is going to be cast down. And a host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression. So when we're dealing with it here, we're dealing with the daily and the abomination of desolation. The daily begins when? 723 BC, right? And the transgression of desolation begins in 538. These are two periods of 1260 years. So, um, so when it's talking here about the 2520, the Kazone, um, we can see that this is, um, where's the verse? So it came to pass when I, even Daniel, had seen the vision, that's the Kazone, that it's talking primarily about the two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. And papalism ends in 1798, correct? So even though we often talk about it, the 2300 days is part of the Kazone, right? So we're saying, well, we have the 2520 and there's 2300 days are part of it, they're different portions of the same great prophetic period. And we say, well, you know, the Kazone then is, is the 2520 for Judah. But it is also true that both 2520s are connected. So even though it's here talking about the 2520 for Northern Israel, that's why I said it's a trick question. We know that they're not separated because what happens to Northern Israel, that line of Israel is going to be stretched over the line of Judah. The line of Samaria is stretched over the line of Jerusalem, right? And so we can't separate these 2520s as just, you know, the one is the Kazone, the one is something else. They're both part of this Kazone. Now we know the other vision, the Marah, that vision is the 2300 days. That's the one uh, in um, on, where, uh, where is it here? Make this man to understand. So when it goes here in verse 13, where we have Palmoni, make this man to understand the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation. You can see the chazon there is about the daily and the transgression of desolation. Right? And then he's going the response is going to be Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So we know that this is connecting to 1844, not to 1798. And so when he talks about the vision um, and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. That word appearance is the word morah, right? 
It just means vision. It's going to be the same word in 8.16. I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the Marah, the vision. And then when he gives the understanding, he says, so he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. And he said unto me, understand who son of man for at the time of the end shall be the chazon. So the time of the end is when? 1798, right? Correct, yes. So again, you can see this chazon is connecting to 1798. So technically, on the other one, of course, is Habakkuk. So if you go to Habakkuk chapter 2, um, Habakkuk chapter 2 is addressing uh, the chazon, right? The Lord answered me and said, write the vision, chazon, and make it plain upon tables. Now, we would say, well, you know, we have the 2520 on the tables is the 2520 for Judah, right? So you would say, well, the chazon here has to be that one. But no. you can see. But you can see that they're not connect that they're connected. That you're not going to just separate the one for northern Israel and say that that's the kazon, even though it's about the two desolating powers. That it also does include the twenty the twenty five twenty for Judah because they're part of the same prophecy. Their starting points are given in Isaiah chapter seven. Okay, you were going to say something there, Dwayne. I'm still thinking that this is more the seven times for Israel than Judah. Now, I, I'm not disagreeing that they both have an interrelationship. Yeah. But I I believe that Hiram Edson's point has been very much overlooked in a lot of situations, and especially with what Elder Jeff was doing. Yeah, so, so I would agree. I would say it primarily refers to the 2520 for Northern Israel. But you can't exclude the 2520 for Judah. Just I'm not for the, trying to. Yeah, just, I know. But, but what I'm saying is you can't just say it is only that because the one that's written on the 1843 chart is the 2520 for Judah. Starts with 677. So it doesn't start with 723. So 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 we know that it's connected, right? They're, they're intertwined with each other. So, so that's why I'm saying it's a trick question. A person could argue, you know, they would use this verse. No, it's the, the Kazone is, you know, the one for Judah. I know. Another, I know. Oh, What's that, William? Ain't it also tied up with the 220? Well, the 220 is just the portion uh, for the one for Judah where the 2300 days begins. But yeah, I mean, it's part of it, right? The, the 220 and the 2300 are part of the, the great prophetic period. Right, so there's 220 years and 2300 years. They're both different portions, you know, when you deal with the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, they're both diff different portions of the 2520. Same great prophetic period, right? So, so we need to keep in mind, though, that the primary idea here with the Chazon is it is about the two desolating powers, right? That's, that's kind of the point I wanted to make here. And that it brings us to the time of the end, that the time of the end shall be the vision. <clears throat> okay? Um, so I'm just saying here, Rome exalts itself to establish the Chazon, right? And Rome establishes the Chazon because it doesn't, it doesn't begin the 2520 uh, for Israel or the 2520 for Judah, but it comes and establishes the two desolating powers. That is, we have one desolating power is paganism, the other is papalism, but Rome is going to represent part of paganism and it's going to represent the transition from paganism to papalism. It also inherits that 666 symbol from Babylon, right? 
And, and that's going to be then passed to the papacy with those 666 years of, of Miller's and also the other one that we recognize and, and also the one with Ezekiel, right? Tying Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 together. So if we're going to say that he's going to establish the vision representing the two desolating powers, um, what is that in our history? Because we have this, they joined in a threefold union at the Sunday law. Now they are going to establish the vision. So this is Rome. And we have these two desolating powers. So that's how I'm understanding it. It's the Kazon, right? I would think that to be correct. Okay. So so how are we then going to understand this in our history? Is it not uh, the UN and uh, the papacy coming together? Okay. I don't think so. Um at least that's not how I'm thinking. Okay. okay. Is, is there a joining of the two sticks? Yes. Okay. Now, now we know that we, we've had confusion in our movement regarding um, the times of the Gentiles, right? So the times of the Gentiles um, and also uh, the indignation, right? So we've had this, when I came into this movement, I didn't think that. The people really understood as they were talking about the 2520, just because we had some, we were a little bit uh, myopic in how we were looking at it. So we would just say um, we have uh, the one 2520 for Israel is the scattering, the other ones, the trampling, right? Uh, the 2520 for Judah, things like that. We would say different things where we would. We didn't really distinguish how to understand this. So at the last end of the indignation, when does that end? The last end of the indignation. When does it end? If there's a last end of the indignation, when is the first end of the indignation? What is the indignation? God's wrath. So I presume the first end would be the seven last plagues, and the last uh -huh. end would be when the wicked are thoroughly cleared from from all of creation. Okay, these actually relate to the twenty five twenty. So, um, so let's look at the Bible verses that address this. So this is Daniel eight, uh, nineteen, right? So this is the interpretation of the vision. Um. So he, he has this explanation about the Kazon, right? The daily and the abomination of desolation. And he says in verse 19, and he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. Right? So that means if there's a last end, there's a first end. Okay? So the last end is what he wants to show him. But then he's going to go back. He says, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Grisha, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Alexander. Now that being broken, whereas, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, and a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So that's pagan Rome, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy, um, and uh, this word policy, discretion, knowledge, prudence, sense, understanding, wisdom, intelligence, right? Also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. So craft is a deceiving fraud, right? 
So fraud shall prosper in his hand um, and shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but shall be broken without hand. So this is pagan Rome. But then he says, the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true. Wherefore thou shut, shut thou up the vision, the kazone, for it shall be many days. So you have the vision, the mara of the evening and morning, but he needs to shut up the kazone. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose and did the king's, rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, the marah, but none understood it. And we know that he's going to come in verse 9, and he's going to get an understanding of uh, the 70 weeks, which is going to be called the matter. And he's going to have an understanding of the matter and of uh, the 2300 days in Daniel chapter uh, 10 and 11, he's going to have that understanding. So once he has that understanding, God can unfold to him the history of Daniel 11. I know that's a really long explanation, but the point here is that when you talk about the last end of the indignation, it's talking about the papacy. It's talking about the one that's going to end in 1798. So the first end is paganism. The last end is papalism. And, and what he's going to be shown is what's going to happen at the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be, right? So this is bringing us to the time of the end in 1798. And Daniel's going to stand in his lot at the end of days, as we know but from Daniel chapter 12. That the book of Daniel is then going to be opened up. And that's where Daniel is being brought to. He's being brought to the end of the kazone. So the last end of the indignation is the, 20, the, the 1260 for the papacy from 7 verse 25. 12 verse 7 has the first end of the indignation. That's the scattering of the power of the holy people. And so this isn't well understood by people in this movement. These distinctions were, were not clear. People were just kind of throwing around terms like the indignation or the um, uh, you know, the gathering and the scattering. Um, and, and so we weren't really clear about what we were talking about, trampling underfoot, all of these types of things. We'd say that one, you know, 125, 20 scatters, the other gathers. It's not really true. It's, it's not how it works. There's kind of a truth to it, but that's not, not really clear, right? It's not, it's clearly not as simple as that. Was that. So, <clears throat> Um, and I didn't actually share my screen, it looks like. I meant to share this. Um, edit. Collected. So, so I went through all those verses without me looking at them. Um, but let's go back to the document I just stopped sharing. Go back to here. <clears throat> so we have these two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. This is the Kazone. And if we're going to put it into our history, we recognize that there's the joining of the two sticks, right? That is, we have a 2520 for Northern Israel. That's the false prophet. It's going to end in 1798. And then we have the 2520 for Judah that ends in 1844. And that's going to be God's people. God's going to have set up a denominated church for the first time since Jerusalem's probation closed in 34 AD. So God's denominated people are going to become Seventh-day Adventists. God's chosen people. So there's this whole period of time where God does not have a denominated people. Not until Seventh-day Adventists come. And that's because probation closed for God's denominated people in 34 AD. Now, we talk about the joining of the two sticks. The two sticks the one for Northern Israel and the one for Judah. And this is something that has to occur before the Sunday law. That is, it occurs in our history when the Protestants, the true Protestants, join with, because they come from apostate Protestantism, a false prophet, they're going to join with us. 
Now remember in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 that there is a call made to northern Israel prior to its destruction, the destruction of Samaria. And this is going to be made in 727, right? So you're looking around there, 727, maybe 726. I, I think it's 727. Um, so two years, four years um, before um, I think that's the right date. So, no, it must be 726. Uh, anyway, it's in that history. It's going to be in the first year. It's called the first year of Hezekiah. So he's going to have this Passover. They're going to cleanse the temple. Eight days, cleanse the priests cleansing the holy place. Eight days, uh, the Levites cleansing them, uh, or the other way around. Holy, most holy by the priests and the holy by the Levites. Right, 16 days altogether. And, and then they decide that they're going to have a Passover in the second month. And they're going to invite northern Israel to this Passover. And people come, right? A remnant comes out of northern Israel prior to its destruction. This is one of the reasons why we know Edwin Thiel's chronology is wrong. Because he doesn't have Hezekiah's uh, reign begin until 10 years after the destruction of Samaria. He doesn't put Hezekiah and Hoshea as contemporaries, right? So, uh, so he basically rejects that, rejects um, Second Chronicles 29 and 30, rejects the chronology in uh, Second Kings uh, 17 and 18, dealing with Hezekiah and Hoshea, right? So, and we're not going to reject the scriptures just to fit some theory about Assyrian chronology that's wrong. Okay, so, so we have these two desolating powers. So to establish the vision, what vision is it that we're establishing here? Because Rome's going to rise up, but it's going to establish the two desolating powers. So how would we apply this to our history? Does it have to do with the joining of the two sticks? And if so, how do we get it to, to... So we've got this Sunday law. So these two sticks join to pass the Sunday law test. But how does that relate to Rome exalting themselves, joining in the threefold union at the Sunday law? to establish the vision. Anybody? Would you repeat your question, please? Okay. So here we have, in this history of the Sunday Law, we have the papacy, Rome, right? Exalts right. itself to establish the vision. In this case, it can't be the Chazon from 723 to 1798, right? Right. Representing the two desolating powers. It represents something in our history. And so what vision is it there that they're establishing? What is it? How would we represent that? We know it has to do with the joining of the two sticks. Okay, go on. I would I would almost think it was the Marais. Because it's a false. They, so you're going to say that the zone here, which is what's a mention, mentioned, so they're going to establish the vision, the zone. But if we're making a present tr truth application, we're going to apply it to the Marais. So what you're okay, isn't it? I mean, the mare is where the prophets fall on their face because they're presented with a vision of Christ, right? Yes. 
But this here is not the moray in, in the Hebrew, it's kazon, right? So I, we, we, the original kazon. Yeah, but you're saying that you would then, in our present truth ap application, just move it to the moray. You wouldn't, would, get, you wouldn't have it as the joining of the two slaves. I would be placing it at in this in this conversation in this discussion as the mare because what the papacy is doing is a false mare. Well, that could be true. I mean, but I I still think you would have to take the fact that we have the kazone that we're paralleling the two desolating powers because that's what the kazone is. And so we have to parallel that symbol in his, this historic application with our time, right? right. So, so we have to first look at the fulfillment of the prophecy as it occurred, you know, historically, and then we make a present truth application of that history. So Rome established itself uh, or exalted itself to establish the vision. In doing so, it, it these two guests, right? So we have these two desolating powers. And so that's what we have to make the application of. We can't just say, well, we have the word vision and we could put Mara in there now in our time. I don't see how we could do that. I don't know if we have a precedent for that because we always have to look at the historic application first. Does that make sense? Go, yeah, are we not going to put it when Edom and Mobite and Ammonite join, which is uh, at the Sandalo? Okay, yeah, so we know that um, that there are going to be some that escape out of the hand of the papacy, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon, right? And if we compare that with Ezekiel, we also put the Philistines in there, okay, in that history. But that's after the Sunday law, right? So after the Sunday law, we have um, – that occur and those people that escape out of the hand of the papacy are are they christians or non-christians yeah when we look at the lines we find that uh first of all we need to find that uh uh it's more like a mirror which simply means uh First, it will be Sunday keepers. Then later on, it will be non-Christians, which is uh, the world. Right. So, so the joining of the two sticks, these two desolating powers, we're going to just say that that's the kazon, right? But, but it includes not just the kazon for northern Israel. It also can can includes the zone, the kazon for Judah. And Judah represents the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Israel represents apostate Protestantism. And those two sticks join prior to the Sunday law. Now, Jeff said between midnight and the midnight cry, as the image of the beast is being formed, we're going to see Protestants recognizing because they also are Protestants, they're true Protestants. They don't like the papacy. And as they see these events unfolding, they're going to join themselves with the people of God who are going to be opposed to the papacy, right? And so those two sticks join. And so when the Sunday law comes, those Protestants were represented by Northern Israel, apostate Protestantism. They're going to join with us and they will stand with us at the Sunday law. But Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon, those after the Sunday law, as they see these things unfolding, that group of people are going to come out of Babylon and many of them are going to be martyrs, but they're going to stand for the truth, right? Because they're not going to have enough knowledge to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, right? To go through the seven last plagues, right? They're not going to have enough experience, not just intellectual knowledge. 
And, but we know that once that happens, that they, that is Rome, shall fall. And so the collapse of the Greek empire, um, that's where we would have to say, well, if those that rise to exalt the vision, it can't be the Seleucid Syrian empire that collapses in 63 BC. That's where we have to sort of figure out because he was making an application different. So we're going to come back to that tomorrow because our time is up. So we're going to come back to this part. How are we going to deal with this last part of verse 14? So thank you, everyone. Hopefully this was helpful to go through this in this way. It's kind of a review, um, but we're really trying to focus on um, understanding these passages, and it, it takes a bit of work. So any final comments before we close with prayer? Remember, we have to come back to this tomorrow. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful for all your blessings. And um, we pray that you can watch over us today and care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And.